welcome to our Word of Life radio program here in wonderful Okinawa, Japan. We give glory to the Lord of the harvest. There's a harvest blessing here for you tonight. Come on, join us. to rain, but I want to I want to help you to uh, to hear something today. So let's open up with a word of prayer and then we're going to go into the word today uh, for the next four weeks. We're going to track together and help you to understand some things that are powerful. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your help today. I pray for your help to help me to communicate your word to your people. And I pray for us, Father God, your people, your church to receive your word, that it would not just come into our ears, but Father, make a difference in our heart and then in the outcome of our life. I thank you for every person that's here this morning. I pray that you would bless them, bless their family, bless all those that are watching by live stream, Father God, and that you would minister to them powerfully in the name of Jesus and everyone in agreement said, Amen. So I love that statement. As many of you know, that's probably one of my life statements that I like. You know, there's a lot of what I call life verses, verses that have changed my life. And one of them is taken from that series opener where um, in Mark chapter 6 verse 12, it says and they they And they preach with joyful urgency that life could be or can be radically different. And most people, even after they experience Christ, 
pretty much don't live a radically different life. And yet it's available to them. And I want to share with you today, foundationally, why and how you can live a radically different life by discovering and fulfilling your destiny. There is a God-given destiny for every person in the kingdom of God. While it's available to every person, but you have to go to the door of Jesus Christ to understand God's purpose and your future. And I don't want to jump ahead too far, but let me say that without any question, God has designed for you to walk in a destiny that he has in the palm of his hand that will bring you not only a wonderful life, but a destiny that brings fulfillment in your life that he orchestrated with you in mind before you were even born. And, but oftentimes when we hear the word destiny, there's a lot of thoughts that kind of are conjured up in our minds, you know, and questions. And because it sounds a bit mystical, but it's really not. Biblically, every, every Christian should be committed to discovering and fulfilling their God-given destiny. And I want you to hear what I'm emphasizing. God-given destiny versus man-made-up destiny. That's just a different story. And I'll cover that. But destiny is not an act of fate, meaning F-A-T-E. It's an, But it will require your faith. F-A-I-T-H. And it's not a matter of chance, but it will require your choice. Destiny is not automatic, but it has been authorized by the Heavenly Father to bring fulfillment into your life. And so God has planned a wonderful life and destiny, but you and I must take the responsibility to discover it and to live it out by faith in Christ Jesus. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 9, that a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So obviously in that verse, you can see that you can make plans, but the Lord might have another direction for you to go in even though you've made good plans. So I want you to understand God has his part to play and you and I have our part to play. No doubt God is committed to his part. You and I have to commit to our part because the plan for your life is exciting, it's adventurous, it's encouraging, it's a blessing not only to you but to so many other people. And before the foundation of the world, God had you in mind. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6, uh, sorry, 2 verse 10 in the Amplified Bible, I'll read a paraphrased version because of, of time. It says, for we are recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew. It says, again, God predestined, planned beforehand for us that we should walk living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. So what this says is there is a road, a path that's been predestined, a journey, a walk that he already orchestrated for you. And... Yet I want you to understand the conflict sometimes comes in with our plans and God's plan. And so destiny, God-given destiny that brings all the fulfillment, that, that brings everything you would ever want, is found in Christ. Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 18, you know this verse. It says, God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That hope means joyful expectation. We can take off on plans that God really didn't orchestrate, but we like it because we saw someone else do it. Or we like the outcome of what they did. You see, but they might be walking out 
their God-given destiny. You might just like what they're doing. And there's nothing wrong with that. But God has and has not left you out of anything. So, and would say, my best is yet to come. So I have this passion to see, you know, all of God's people that God created walk in the fulfillment of what God created them to be. I have this desire to see people fulfill their destiny, you know, and for that reason... You know, today, you might not know this, but we did start these these um, classes. And so I've been thinking about this whole uh, class is called Destiny Training. And so for months, I've been kind of thinking about this. And so I decided to kind of open up here today. And uh, these classes are really, you know, they're innovative, they're creative, they're relevant. And um, but I do know this, and I'm going to endeavor to prove this this morning in a very simple way, just kind of laying a foundation of where we're going to go. And that is that destiny is discovered through discipleship. Most people don't understand that. But destiny, your destiny, your God-given destiny, will be discovered through discipleship. And discipleship plays a very big role in helping you build a foundation for where God wants you to go. And uh, I'll, I'll point that out to you as I move along. So, you know, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you found out why. That why has to do with your destiny. Say destiny. And, and that why is very important. No matter how you got to this world, no matter how you got here, right now, God knows exactly who you are. And the Bible is very clear that he was thinking of you before you were even here. And he has a plan for your life. So what might look like a mistake, an accident, an oops, is not. God has a plan, a purpose, a God-given destiny, if I can say it that way, for your life. Everyone say, thank you, Jesus. And so the church, which you have to understand, is not an aimless group gathering of people. And uh, we're not aimless. We are a people of destiny. We are a people that have destiny. Let me explain to you a little bit about this. When you were born again, or if you're not, I'm not just talking about coming to church, but when you are born again, three magnificent, miraculous, Instant transformations take place in your life. Whether you ever capitalize on them is your choice. But let me tell you what they are. The moment you are born again, you get number one, a new identity. Number two, you have a new ability. And number three, you have a new destiny. Amazing. Say thank you, Lord. And I want you to hear this this way. Let me hear where it comes from. In Acts chapter 11, verse 9, El Pedro, his name is Peter. We call him El Pedro. And P Peter was, was ministering. He was one of the 12 of Jesus. And, and uh, one day, you know, he's at the house of Simon the Tanner. He's on the rooftop waiting for food. That's Peter. Come on, somebody. It's like some people I know in Hawaii. Anyways, I was waiting for the food. Where's the food? That's where I'm going to be. Anyways, he was on the roof and he went into a trance and God gave him a vision. In that vision, God spoke to him three times the same thing. And, uh, and it was about the Gentiles receiving salvation, which was, you know, very new for Jewish people. And so in this vision, there's something very significant. So he comes back to his, um, his other dis uh, peers disciples and they're they're asking him for an explanation as to what has taken place and so he, he he shares this word from Acts chapter 11 verse 9 he says but a voice answered me again from heaven what God has cleansed you must not call common 
What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Everyone read that out loud with me. Ready? One, two, three, read. But a voice answered to me again from heaven. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now, in our vernacular, our usage of words, the word common means typical. It means average. It means um, mundane, ordinary, status quo. You know, it means uncelebrated, unrecognized, and certainly uninteresting. And that's exactly what you are not. You are not any of those words. Because what God has cleansed by the power of His cross, through the salvation of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of His blood, through forgiveness of our sins, is no longer, in God's eyes, in part of your destiny, common. You are not common, meaning the opposite is true. You are uncommon. Say, I am uncommon. And you have three things referring, I'll put it to you this way. You have an, now an uncommon life, you have uncommon power, and now you live by an uncommon dream. And I want you to realize that those three things, the uncommon life is about your new identity in Christ Jesus. You know, your, un, your uncommon power is about your new ability in the Holy Spirit. And now your uncommon dream is about a new destiny authored by the Heavenly Father. So you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working in your life. Say, thank you, Lord. You know, and that all took place the day you were born again. Those three things are keys to fulfilling and discovering your life destiny. And the good thing is that anywhere you might be right now, maybe you're not where you want to be financially or relationally or circumstantially. Those are not limiting factors for you. They're not limiting factors, not just for you here, but for any person who receives Jesus Christ into their life. Because you no longer live by the old man. You live by a new man. You have a new identity. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You have a new ability, the power of the living God who now resides on the inside of you. And now you have a new dream to live by. And that is called your destiny. And that God authored, born into you. And now you have have a right to fulfill it. Somebody put your hands together for Jesus. Amen. And, and it's exciting to, to know that you're not aimless and aimless. Let me say it this way. Living an aimless life is under the curse. It's not a blessing. It's a curse. It's something that you as a believer or any believer is set free from. No person has to live aimless or confused or disoriented or, you know, or, or in darkness. That is not what your covenant says and that's not who you are. That's who you were. That's not who you are. And I'll show you that scripturally. But let me show you what I mean by this. And I'm, my story is not your story, but I, but to relate a story, when I was, um, when you don't have, hmm, be careful here, but, but um, oftentimes many people do a lot of things and they never ask God, what do they want, what should they be doing? And so they only ask God afterward, many years, why am I doing what I'm doing? God will eventually respond because I never told you to do it, um, or whatever it is. Now please, my illustration is my illustration, that's all. So don't, don't take it on yourself. But when I first got started, you know, I didn't really know what to do with my life. Uh, I'd been a soccer player and I got through uh, um, 
college and I was going to do well in soccer. Apparently I had a, a little bit of a skill and uh, it attracted some interest, got some scholarships. Okay. And then for some reason, and I didn't know why, you know, I said, gee, I'd like to trade schools. I was at a school called UCSB, University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and, um, and apparently a scout had seen me and then they, they had me go over to you know, USC, the greatest school known to mankind, especially if you belong to UCLA. But anyways, we'll, we'll talk more football later on in a few years. But, but uh, so I went into the Department of Architecture and ultimately I graduated in architecture. But I, you have to understand, long story short, and I won't drag this out, it's, it's, I didn't know what to do, so I picked that. And I got accepted in the School of Architecture. And uh, I graduated with a degree. I worked in one of the finest offices once I graduated. And, uh, but that was, you know, am I going to say God didn't have his hand in it? No, but I, my, let me just go on. And so eventually what ends up happening is um, I ended up following Kuna to Hawaii. For some reason, she left me. I don't know why a person would leave me. Well, if you knew me back then, you'd probably know why. But anyways, and um, I couldn't make up my mind. Rafi. Anyways, uh, what ended up happening? I'm sorry, did something come out of my mouth? I just, 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 just plain. I'm sorry, that's embarrassing. <laughs> that's between Rafi, Brittany, and myself. <laughs> did I just let everybody in on something? Okay, anyways, so... So I, I travel here, and then I work in an architectural firm, a very good one, as a matter of fact. And um, and we are doing well. And my boss at that time was a, was a Christian, and we were both basically going to the same church. But um, he never told me what to do. This and the other, he wanted me to become the architect that he hired me to be. So there I was trying to work. And one day, my desire begins to change. Long story short, I asked the Lord, "Why is my desire changing? I wanted to be the richest Latino architect." You know in the world. All I meant by that is that I wanted to, you know, live a good life. I was the first person to ever graduate from university in both generational lines. I mean, this is pretty exciting. And, um, and I had a professional direction. But see, there's a difference between my story, not yours, between vocation and calling. Between just doing something because it's good to do and doing what God wants you to do. This is my story, not necessarily yours. And so... And so what it ends up happening is, of course, I stepped out of the vocation and, um, and God called me and God placed me into you know, the ministry. And I had no idea that we would be this far along with so many amazing people and so many services going on in the Sunday. But it all starts with obedience. Now, of course, God uses Christians and believers in every field of endeavor. And that could be where God wants you. That was my story. So what I'm simply saying to you is this. There is a destiny for your life. I didn't know it when I got started. You know, I wish you would have told me earlier. We would have saved hundreds of thousands of dollars. Come on, somebody. Anyways. But this is what I want you to understand. We are the blood-bought church of the redeemed. And you and I have been redeemed from aimlessness. You're not an aimless person. Not knowing what to do with your life. You know, you don't, God didn't call you to sit around, does he want me to prosper, does he not want me to prosper, does he want me to be happy, does he not want me to be happy, does he want me to have joy, does he, want me, does he want me to, you know, no. See, that's aimless, that's not knowing what the word says, but let me help you something, with something. Living aimless is what I call being under the curse. Galatians 3.13, it says, we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. You are not under a curse. You are redeemed to live free. And the Bible says in 1 John 3.8 in the Amplified Bible, that the reason Jesus Christ was made manifest was to undo, destroy, loosen the works that the devil has done. Now, most people don't look at aimlessness as something very significant. You know, they'll look at healing, they'll look at other things, and they're very important. And, but aimlessness is a plague 
in our society. It's a plague where people don't know how to live their lives all their life. It's not that they can't do things. They're just confused. They're aimless. Think of what the word aimless means. Aimless means you have no aim. That was deep. <laughs> Now you might think I'm just playing with words. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is ministering to people. This is the passage where he sees the confusion of people. And this is what it says. When he looked over the crowds, his heart broke, which means he had compassion. Another translation. So confused and aimless were the people. They were like sheep without a shepherd. You know... Jesus needs to be in the center of our life so we can find out the aim of our life, the destiny of our life, the purpose of our life. Confusion is not of God. Disorientation is not of God. Frustration is not of God. Struggle is not of God. Those are works of the devil. And Jesus came and he was manifested to break those things. So that doesn't belong to you. And so don't accept it, reject it in the name of Jesus. Amen. But I want you to hear this. I'm, gonna, I'm showing you. So he comes and he sees the people that are not saved yet. And they're, they're confused. Number one. Another translation says they're powerless, they're hopeless, and they're directionless. Sheep without a shepherd. But in this case he says they're confused and they're aimless and they have no shepherd. Well, Peter said this, by the blood of Jesus, that we have been redeemed from aimless conduct. We and I have been redeemed from aimless conduct simply means the way you live. You don't have to wake up every day and say, oh, I'm going to do my life. You know, you're 30 years old, you're 35 years old. You know, you're 40, you're 50, you're 60, you're 70. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You know, I'm not, I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm here to help you. Here, so please listen to what I'm saying to you. Because if you've bought into that, it's time to bury it. No more buying into that mentality. And it is exactly that. It's a way of thinking that doesn't belong to you. We have to renew our mind so that we can live out our God-given destiny. Can somebody put their hands together for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Say, I've been redeemed. Here it says, I've been, we've been redeemed from aimless conduct. So what Peter is saying, you know, you know, conduct that has no rhyme, no reason. Conduct that has no aim. What does aim mean? Aim simply in any dictionary, uh, there are many words, but it means to have direction, to have a destination, to have a dream, to have a destiny. To have d destination means destiny. It also goes on to, to mean that to have a target, to have a goal, to be on a course, to live for a cause, to have meaning, to have purpose, to have a plan, to have a pursuit for your life. And, and you need to understand that God never left you or anyone else out. He doesn't leave anybody out because he came to redeem you and I from aimless living so that we can live not aimlessly but in destiny. Come on somebody. God wants you to live out your destiny not aimlessly. And so it's important that you and I understand. Even Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians said this. He said, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. He says, even as a Christian, I don't get up and like box in the air. If you go back and read that, I said like one boxing in the air. I know exactly what I'm doing. I know how to discipline myself. I know where I'm going. I know my, my, my life is about purpose. It's about God's plan for my life. I'm not just living out any old destiny. I'm living out God's destiny for my life. I'm living out the God plan for my life. And God 
never left you out and don't buy into the fact that you know too much time has passed I've made two mistakes too many mistakes or pastor you don't understand where I'm living it's right where you're living that he speaks to you that he doesn't want you to live there see if things aren't good right now he's trying to tell you right now through this like donkey right here you know he's trying to tell you that's not where he wants you to live now if Balaam had to listen to a donkey if Balaam listened to a jackass that's King James version that's all it is King James I'm not cussing believe me go back and read it it's in the Bible King if the king his name was James had a version of donkey and he called the jackass so at least listen to it. if Balaam could listen from direction of a jackass then maybe you might be open to what I have to say from the Bible that is amen Someone's kicking against them. Anyways, uh, but notice God doesn't want you. So that's, for me, to you, that's good news. Say good news. It is good news. It really is good news. Because you, you, you might be a little confused. Or you might be a little frustrated. Or maybe things didn't look like they worked out the way you wanted them to work out. You tried something. You didn't get this. And you didn't get that. And, and whatever it was. And you know, this is God has not forgotten you. He is directing your steps. Maybe you made a plan, but it says in Proverbs 69, God is now directing your way. You have to be. You know, I didn't understand why I moved to Hawaii. I didn't come to move to Hawaii. I didn't come to live here. I didn't. I didn't know there was going to be a Nicole, let alone a Branson. That was a surprise. No, you know, <laughs> you know, I didn't know I was going to have, you know, four wonderful daughters. I didn't know any of this. I, I didn't know any of that. I came to pick up Kuna and take her back to the promised land called California. <laughs> Where all the Latinos live. Orale. What's up, Holmes? <laughs> Shoot, you know, we're low riders. Line, okay, anyway, sorry. But the church is a people of destiny. Say destiny. Say we are a people of destiny. And fulfilling God-given destiny is important. And this is what's important. That destiny is discovered through discipleship. In discipleship, two things happen. Number one, you build a foundation for the plan of God in your life. Services are never enough. You have to build a specific foundation. That's why we call destiny training. And that's why we have destiny training for, you know, young adults because God is raising up a generation of young adults. And there are young adults in this room right now. You should be going to destiny training. It's in the next, next hour, 11 o'clock service. Why? For you to do something? No, because we're trying to get you someplace. And we're going to help you to do that. And, uh, and so the thing is this. A second thing is you'll learn, you'll learn in, the, in the foundation that you build is a foundation on Jesus Christ. So many people, when they go to church, they build a foundation on religion, on traditions, on rituals, but not on Jesus Christ. We want to help you to not disciple you to be like a personality. We want you to be like Jesus Christ. We want you to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what he's come to do in your life. We want you to know the Heavenly Father and this incredible unconditional love he has for you. And that he has a plan and a purpose. And I understand when a person's getting started, they have questions. It's okay to have questions. But the word and the foundation is what breaks the questions off of you and it gives you conviction to live life even though everything around our lives at times doesn't look all that perfect. God is perfecting you. Amen? And so the second thing it does, it separates the... See, most people want the specific will of God in their life. But they don't want the... Um, they don't want to build on the general will of the life. The general will is the foundation of Jesus, the word of God. Most people try to hear God's voice, but they don't know what his word says. If you don't know what his word says, you will not hear his voice. You'll hear voices, but you won't hear his voice. And, um, and see, you can't hear the sound of your heavenly father if you don't know what his word sounds like. You can't, if you don't know what his word is saying, you won't know what he is saying to you. 
and you'll confuse your thoughts or philosophies of this world with God's specific thought for your life. Or you'll confuse the, a world's desire for God's desire and you'll end up doing that in your life. Sitting in your room going, hmm, how did I get here again? And, uh, and I just want you to realize discipleship is very important. God is always giving people an opportunity. Let me give you a real story. Um, this is a story of a man by the name of Mickey Cohan. And he was involved in an organized crime back in the 1950s. True story. And I've shared it before, but I think this has a great fit for here. Back in the 1950s, a notorious gangster by the name of Mickey Cohan controlled the bulk of organized crime in Los Angeles, California. Uh, there was a movie made about him not too long ago. I think it was 2013. And many people have heard of this hideous, of all of his hideous and hideous deeds. But few know about his faith story. One day, Mickey Cohan heard about a young evangelist by the name of Billy Graham, who was holding a revival meeting there in the Los Angeles Coliseum, Southern California area. And all Southern Californians flocked to hear this famous, famous preacher. And so Mickey Cohan was curious. He was a gangster, but he was curious. And he knew that he was leading a miserable life. He felt miserable, and he desperately needed help. So he made the decision to attend the crusade. During the crusade, Mickey Cohan felt God calling him to go to the altar. Can you say altar? Along with thousands of others who accepted forgiveness for his sins, Mickey admitted that he needed a new life in Christ Jesus, which Billy Graham spoke about. So he made the decision to receive Christ. Now that's great news, isn't it? Except for the rest of the story. It says, well, six months later, when Billy Graham came back to Los Angeles, he sat down with his famous Mickey Cohen. Six months had passed, and he discovered that nothing really had changed in Mickey Cohen's life. The gangster was still running drugs and putting, quote unquote, the squeeze on people and doing a lot of hideous activities. And beyond his outer actions, his inner world was still as miserable as it always been. Billy warned Mickey that it wasn't possible to be a Christian gangster. <laughs> Mickey Cohen says, hey, if you have Christian cowboys and you have Christian Hollywood people, how come I can't be a Christian gangster? I mean, he, you're talking about super young, okay, in the Lord. But Mickey felt that he couldn't start over again. And Billy pressed him on the problem, but Mickey admitted that he couldn't put down his pride, the wealth, the pleasures to pursue God's ways. In the end, Mickey Cohen never did change. Sadly, he died the notorious criminal he had always been. Now, was that altar a phony? No. You know what was missing? There was no one to disciple him. For six months, when a person receives the Lord, what they do is they go from, from an altar or a decision and they go back into uh, the, the same old activities. And there's no one to encourage them, no one to keep them direction. So there's no one from the altar to their destiny. Do you follow me on this? Let me, let me close out one more story and this will, this will be it. And um, it'll be it. I can do it in about five minutes. It's on Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Let's end with a, with a biblical passage here. Let's all read it together. Ready? Read. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him and became his disciple. Now... Matthew is not an accident. The fact that Jesus walked across his path is not an accident. Let me be clear about this in summary. 
but very important for you and to, for us to close out. Because I said to you earlier, and I need to qualify, that destiny is discovered through discipleship. What does that mean? Okay. Jesus is going along, and he's not wasting his time. He has only three and a half years of ministry. Everywhere he goes, it's the direction of his heavenly father. There's nothing that he doesn't do that is not orchestrated by his father. So this is a lesson for you and I. Okay? And so he goes to this man by the name of Matthew. Now, what you might not know about Matthew, Matthew was a Jew, but Matthew was a hated Jew. He was despised because they called him a traitor, a betrayer, a turncoat against the Jewish nation. Because Roman government would hire Jewish people to go against their own people in collecting taxes. Because too many Romans had tried to do it and it didn't end up well for them. And so... And so, you know, and for a person to become a tax collector of this magnitude, you mean you really had to have a hard heart. And he had a hard heart for many reasons. Yet he, Matthew was a Jewish man. And so, you know, oftentimes in those collector's booth that he, he made, he'd skim off the top. That's how he'd make some money. People knew that. He was like, he had enforcers. Sometimes he'd have centurions by him or guards, Roman guards. And when the people would come up, the Jewish people, and he'd say, hey, pay your taxes. They would say, but you know our condition. And he says, pay your taxes or these boys are going to take care of you. <laughs> Something like that. And, um, and so, you know, he was a hated man. So imagine Matthew trying to walk down the street. Man, they would cuss him out, call him everything but God. Call him everything but righteous. How could you do this? Turn against your people. You're a betrayer. For us, it would be you and I like aligning with Al-Qaeda against a terrorist move for America. I mean, that's, that's where you have to kind of liken it. And that's a horrific way of thinking, but that's the way they saw him, as a betrayer to their nation. Now, Matthew, though, was at the top of his game. He had money. He had the, he had the pennies. He had the ponies. They didn't have cars. They had ponies back in there. They, you know, he had the palace. You know, he had the prestige, as I said. He had the, uh, he had the, uh, the presence in society. He had popularity. You would have seen him on the outside. That man has his game together. But I want you to hear two phrases from this verse that are very important. See, what you couldn't read in that verse is that Matthew was very miserable on the inside. He knew what he was doing to his people. And there was not enough money or a big enough house or enough ponies or enough titles in society that would give you prestige to take away his misery. But one day, Jesus was walking and saw Matthew. But what does that word saw mean? Glad you asked. The word saw means this. Looked right through the man. The word saw means, if you go back and, and define it, it's to look right through. Not to look at. I can see you. What's your name, son? Aaron. I can see Aaron. But it's another thing for Jesus to see right through. The Bible says man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And... Jesus saw Matthew's heart. It was no mistake. And he saw that he was miserable, but he had a facade. I'm hard, I'm tough. Regardless of what you say, you know, he just, he was an angry man. So, that's one phrase. And then he, he pulled the big punch. He said, follow me. Two meanings on follow me. The first meaning is this. He said, Matthew, meaning number one, I want to be your friend. Will you be my friend? Now, that stunned Matthew because every Jewish person hated him for what he was doing. And this Jesus, whether he knew who he was or not, that's not sure, but Jesus was there, a Jewish man, asking another Jewish man, especially Matthew, you want me as your friend? Because Matthew didn't have friends. He had people that would go to his house. 
he'd have to buy his friends. The only reason they'd come over is because he had money and he'd throw the parties and he'd get the wild people and that's, uh, that's how we do it. But he didn't have a friend friend. And certainly he didn't have a Jewish friend. The Bible in the Ampl- in one version says he had the scum of the city there. But the thing is, that's all. And then Jesus heard, I mean Matthew heard, you want to, you, a Jewish man want to be my friend? The second meaning of that is not only do I want to be your friend, but I want to walk on a journey to fulfill a destiny with you. I don't want you to walk behind me. I want to walk right next to you. I want to be a friend that knows you and walks with you and talks with you. And that's what, when Matthew heard that, that's why he got up and became his disciple. You see, my friends, that was Matthew's altar. He still had to fulfill his destiny. Matthew had to go from the altar to destiny. And I want you to understand, and it was only with Jesus. He had no idea that he was going to be an author of a book, well, at least of a major chapter in a book called the Bible, or do the incredible feats that ended up happening in his life because he became a disciple of Jesus. Amazing. So I close. Destiny is discovered through discipleship. Did you receive something today? Put your hands together. Let's all stand to our feet then. I want to encourage all of you uh, today. What we're going to do is... um, if you possibly can, tonight I do have a message that's going to talk about um, Alter to Destiny. It's different than this. And I only have tonight to do it. And uh, if you can join us, it'd be wonderful. But uh, in addition to that, before you leave and outside, we would like to give everyone for free to remind you that maybe you had your altar uh, a while back. Or maybe you know somebody that you're right now maybe currently ministering to in some way. And um, we would like to give each of you one of these. On one side, it's a very thin band, so ladies, it's not going to get in the way of your jewelry. We're always thinking of you ladies. Pastor Kuna is anyway. And, um, And it says, on one side it says, Altar to Destiny. On the other side it simply says, Word of Life. You can put it on very simple it doesn't get in the way even you men it doesn't it doesn't uh, wreck your flow your rhythm <laughs> i guarantee you and uh, but it's that simple and it's to remind you that um, even if you already are pretty much finding your destiny your best is still yet to come keep pressing forward keep going and then for for those of us who are maybe are in this room today and and, and you know we're like we're, we're a little on the English side it's not a negative it's just that it took me a, a while to kind of get my my direction you know those are the things we need to ask God for his help because God wants to help you he knows who you are he knows where you live he got your email address your Twitter account you know come on somebody he follows you on IG, so be careful what you put up on there. Yeah, your selfies, he's like, hmm. Anyways, uh, <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is this. Um, these are free for you. They have, I know our, even our children are getting them. If you have children, we've got size ones for children, but they will get them at their services. They're just going to get them. They might not even know what it is. Like, hey, look what I got. So, okay, it's one per person, okay? And uh, because all the campuses are going to get. But tonight I'm going to a different message than this. It's just going to show you what Jesus said about the altar to destiny, why it makes such a difference. So if you can't join us tonight, I'd really appreciate that. And, of course, the team is going to bring the the worship experience. And um, we're really excited. Bow your heads for just a moment. Let's close in prayer. Father, I want to thank you so much for every person. The understanding of destiny is not, it's, it's not a small matter. It really is a very big, big deal. You paid such a price so that we can live on our destiny. 
And as I mentioned earlier, Father, you reminded us in the in the book of Jeremiah that you know the thoughts you think towards us. Your thoughts are not aimless or confusing or frustrating, but they're thoughts of peace, not of evil. You're not trying to hurt us or hold us back. But Father God, they're of peace. And you hold our future and hope in your hand. And for every person in this room, Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help them to receive that and to walk in it. The confidence that only you can give, the assurance and the security that no matter how things may be right now, you have an amazing and wonderful life for every person, a God-given destiny. And I pray, Father God, that you would cover and that you would speak to every person. As your heads are bowed, please, your eyes are closed. Very importantly, I'd like to say that if you're not sure that you're born again, if you're not sure that you've ever received Christ into your heart, I, I know maybe you've gone to church, and I know obviously you're, you're here today. We appreciate that. But maybe you're not sure that you've ever really asked to be forgiven of your past or maybe for him to come into your heart. It took me almost 27 years to do that. I went to church the majority of my life, but no one ever told me what I'm talking to you about right now. Yet I would go to environments like this. Well, they talked about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it may be that a person's here that has an, uh, a respect for God, but they don't really know whether heaven is their home. And Jesus said, in order for a man to see the kingdom of God, they must be born again. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. And whoever walks through me will be saved. Today, if you're not sure that he lives in your heart, even though you have a respect for God, you can pray a simple prayer that will solidify your relationship with Jesus, and it's real. If you're here today, secondly, and maybe you've fallen away and your life, your walk with Christ isn't where it maybe used to be a while ago, we don't have to know those reasons. But if you're here today, it's no mistake. God wants you to hear. He wants you to hear with your ears that he wants you to fulfill a destiny that he has planned for you. So it's time for you and I to reconnect. So maybe you're saying, I want to reconnect. I want to recommit. I want to rededicate my life. If that's you here today, God has a plan for you. Don't doubt it. Believe it. But it all begins with Jesus Christ being the center of your life. As your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, your hearts are open. If that's you, say, Pastor, would you pray for me in one of those two areas? Absolutely. Right where you're standing. If that would be you right now, just raise your hand real high so I can see it. Anybody in this room, just raise it from, from right to left, front to back, up and down, just all over. Just raise your hand so I can see it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. God, God bless you. All right. Good. I don't see many, but I see some. All right, everybody. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that you sent your son to die for my sins on the cross of Calvary. Today I receive Jesus Christ into my heart. And I believe as I ask for forgiveness that I am forgiven. Forgive me, Lord, for my past. Come and live in my heart. Change my heart. Help me to live out the plan you have for my life. I receive your love, and I declare now that I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. All things become new. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a great big hand clap. Amen. Amazing.
crazy. So I want to be, oh, I'm already four minutes over, but I'm going to release you just a moment. But remember tonight we have an extra service. Um, tonight we have a Sunday night service, not an extra. We always have it. But we're going to be talking about very specific. If you can turn off the TV, come on over here. It'd be awesome. Forget about Jacques in the Box restaurant. If you had reservations, just cancel them. I'm sure they'd understand. Y'all didn't get that one, did you? But we love you. We really appreciate you. If you're here for the first time, don't forget in that door over there. It's our, 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 our visitor's room, so we like to uh, welcome you there. Otherwise, go out and live and begin to discover and fulfill your destiny. Amen? We got more to say to help you. God bless you. High five 3,000 people as you're walking out. Shalom, everyone. God bless each and every one of you. And don't forget to get your bands. They'll be outside. If you go outside, there'll be a table out there. They'll have a band that will fit your wrist. And uh, absolutely free. One per person. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm sure you've been blessed. I'd like to share with you just some information of how you can contact Word of Life Christian Center. Again, our pastors are Pastor Art and Kuna Sepulveda. Our church is in Honolulu, Hawaii. Our mailing address is 550 Queen Street, Honolulu, Hawaii, 96813. If you still use mail, you can go, go ahead and mail us, but you can also contact us via email if you have any questions, if you have anything you want to share with us, you can email us at wolcc at wolhawaii.com. Again, that's wolcc, which stands for Word of Life Christian Center, wolcc at wordoflifehawaii.com. Please email us if you have any questions or if you want to share any testimonies of what God is doing in your life. And we can also we also have a church in Yokohama. If you're ever in Word of Life Yokohama, our pastor there is Pastor Fukiko Matsuzawa. And her phone number, well, let me give you her email. Um, W-O-L dot Japan at F-L-U-T-E dot O-C-N dot N-E dot J-P. You can, e you can also email Word of Life Yokohama if you're ever going to be in the Tokyo, Yokohama area. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to being with you again next Saturday at 9 a.m. Until then, aloha. I want to reach humanity for you. I want to reach humanity for you. I want to reach humanity.